Yes. Welcome to this discussion on filming sensitive subjects with women. While we may be an all woman panel, everyone's welcome to join us and to join us from all over the world as I'm excited that this is a truly global panel. I'm joining you from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in Bermuda, which is perfectly positioned geographically between our two panelists. I'm Lauren Anders Brown, the film program producer for this year's Global Health Film Festival, working with the founder, director, and visionary, Jerry McHugh, who has made this year's festival pandemic possible. We've just watched three short films from the series, A Piece of Me, and I'm honored to have the director of those films here with us today. Joining us from Toronto in Canada is Sarah El Gamal, an international filmmaker who has produced work in Canada, Cuba, Dubai, Morocco, Japan, the UK, and many more places, uh, Ethiopia, as we just saw. Um, using compelling and high quality visuals to tell meaningful global stories, she aims to shift the perceptions of global regions and people by cinematically illuminating the quiet, unseen beauty that is often overlooked. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, before we are joined by our second panelist, I just wanted to ask you a brief question. If you could explain the process behind the making of A Piece of Me, what inspired you and what challenges did you face while filming such a sensitive subject? Yeah, so it was a bit of an interesting journey. Um, I was approached by Usain Abbasi, uh, who was head of social media at um, UNFPA. Um, and basically he said, you know, I like your work. Do you want to work on a campaign with me on FGM since you're Egyptian and it's very prevalent in Egypt? And so you know, I was aware, obviously, of FGM, um, but I didn't really have so much of a personal connection at first. And I said to him, OK, you know, just give me some time. Let me do my research. Um, I'm actually going to Egypt um, in a few months. Let me just kind of sit with it for a bit and, and come up with a concept. And then I started to, you know, ask my mom questions. And I found out that um, my mother, as well as other women in my family, like my aunts, were all subjected to FGM. And I had no idea. Um, I, I guess for me, like, I I figured at first that it happened maybe, um, you know, just like a lot of people in, in villages or maybe it happened, you know, where people uh, maybe had didn't have the same level of education or, or whatever, you know, that people assume about FGM. And once I figured that out, of course, it was pretty traumatizing and, and very sad. And, and, um, and so right away, I kind of just thought about, OK, like how do how can I understand the situation? And I just knew my mother and, and my aunts and all the women in my family were, were so passionate and, and just had, you know, they ran their household and, and they had so many things that they, you know, that they cared about and that defined who they were. And I, I refused to define them as just, you know, victims. And, um, and so in, in sort of tackling the story, I of course asked who said, if we can speak to women who wanted to speak on this issue, um, that was the most important thing for me. And, and so um, we heard back from UNFPA Ethiopia, who were very excited to have us come film there because they had three wonderful activist women, um, Zahra Abedan and Khadija, who, who were doing a lot of work in their community. And so I had this idea where, you know what, I want to shoot this almost like a fashion film. I want people to see this woman. I want these women to look powerful. And I want them to, I wanted to basically show that, you know, these women, have passions and that go beyond just their one source of trauma. And so that's that's where the idea came from. Um, and surprisingly enough, UNFPA were on board with the idea and and it did pretty well. <laughs> um, and when you first landed in Ethiopia, had you been to Ethiopia before? I hadn't, no. Okay, and so what were some of the things you first noticed? What were some of, um, if you can remember anything from your, your first impressions of Ethiopia? Um, yeah, so I mean, of course I did as much research as I could in speaking to the local mm -hmm. team ahead of time. Um, but I mean, there's two things. First of all, we landed in Addis. And so um, I'm from Cairo, I'm born in Toronto, but my family's from Cairo. So there were a lot of similarities there I could see between you know Addis and Cairo. So that was comforting. Um, but yeah, being in Afar is a whole different universe. Um, and it was a very humbling experience, you know, uh, just walking in there, understanding that I, I don't know, you know, and that's okay mm -hmm. not to know. And, um, and so I basically just had to, you know, just be guided by the women and, and, and the people in Afar um, to kind of show us, you know, their ways and, and, 
and it was such an incredible, incredible, beautiful learning experience for me. And did you have any um, challenges when you first met the women, when you said, hi, I'm this woman and I want to come make a subject, a, a film about something that's actually, you know, quite a difficult subject? Yeah, um, the challenges were not necessarily in them wanting to speak about it because they are very excited to speak about it. Um, obviously, there was a language barrier, which is, mm. you know, a, a struggle. Um, and I think for me, it was just, and, and this is, I think, the most humbling moment that I had was a lot of the questions that, like, I was interviewing the woman, but there was a translator who basically would ask the questions for me. Um, a lot of the questions I had were centered on them, you know, like, I wanted to learn about them, I wanted to know what made them happy, what made them excited, what, you know, and, and that's a very, I realized afterwards, a very sort of westernized or you know, privileged sort of perspective is like mm -hmm. they, you know, being a pastoralist, they are very much one with their family, with their community. It's a, it's a, it's a, a method of survival. And so essentially their thought process is very different in terms of like the I, you know, like me, me, me. And, and, and so that was a, a very sort of humbling moment where I'm like, okay, I understand, you know, you don't just take casual walks down the river because you have to, you know, attend to your goats to feed your children, to keep your family alive. And so um, I quickly realized, you know what, I'm just going to let them take on the, the, the conversation and they're just going to tell me what they want to tell me. And I will just do my best to highlight that in, in the way that I can. It's kind of like when you're in the field, it's kind of like a give and take, right? So, you know, you you work around someone's normal everyday habits and stuff. We were like, actually, I really want to film this in either sunrise or sunset because the lighting's the best. But then you realize that so much of the work happens at sunrise. So, you know, what yeah. you're left with sometimes is the middle of the day. And and, 100%, you, yeah. and you have to find a way to make that work because, um, you know, at least for me, I know that takes priority is the, the contributors continue on and that this is um, something that they feel like they're proud to be a part of rather than, um, you know, like that they have to change who they are, or what they're doing or their normal schedule in order to fit to it. For um, sure. And we had to move like pretty quickly to change things around. Like at first it's like, oh, we have three days. And then it was like, no, we have four hours, you know, like, so there was a lot of, a lot of that, which was hectic, but it, it, I mean, it was, it was great. Like at the end of the day, you realize it's, you know, of course their lives and their situations are way more important and we still managed to get what, you know, we could to make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, yeah. I mean, it's stunning, Sarah. It's, it's nothing like Thank I've you. ever seen or, or even thought of before, you know? Um, and it's been, it's amazing to kind of have that support of UNFPA, I think, um, you know, because whenever you make something, you want to have a purpose and you want it to go somewhere. So yeah. it's uh, it's really rewarding to know that you're making it with a purpose and and a place and a platform for it to go. Um, yeah. did, did you have any, um, you know, highs and lows of your of your time and and overall filming with it? And it could be afterwards. It could be, you know, it could be in the edit room. I know sometimes a lot of my low points happen there. Oh man, there were so many. <laughs> our, our plane almost came, like went down on the way back. It was just like a hectic, hectic time. I mean, um, but I mean, I think there, I mean, in terms of highs, like I think it was obviously getting to know the women. Um, like, you know, there were just so many little moments that we shared, even despite the language barrier, you know, where like we had, you know, me, Nadine, the Muslim, the, the, the wardrobe designer, um, when we were like, you know, uh, giving the the fabric to to Zahra. Um, you know, there was a little mirror, and and she was just in the washroom with us. Like, you know, we we're just joking around, and there was no language. You know, like, but we still just were all women in the mirror, like gawking at ourselves, and just you know trying on fabrics. There are little fun moments like that where we really connected uh, with the woman. Um, yeah, low points. I mean, our shoot almost got canceled, basically, like in in the desert by one of the chiefs uh, of the of the town because he felt like. Um, Abida basically ended up having someone in the hospital while we were shooting. And so he just was protecting her and was like, okay, we're going to shut this whole thing down. And there we are like day one with like 13 cases of equipment being like, what, <laughs> what do you mean? And, and I had to, and it was really ended up being a funny story. Me, Osen, the chief and this um, other a man from the, from the town were basically sitting at this, like outside this bar, just having this like kind of, uh, I don't know. It, it was kind of this like what's it with some coffee? Treaty. Yeah, it was just this kind of like thing. And I'm like, where am I? Like, what's happening? I'm having this sort of 
I don't know, debate about this film in, in, in the middle of a far. And it was very, it's one of those moments I'll never forget. This is basically fighting for the film in the desert. <laughs> just, had, um, you, had you even gotten one film done by that point or? No, we hadn't. And, and honestly, it was very much a fight at first to convince the people in, the, um, in Afar why we were doing this. And, and a lot of times I would just constantly have to show them, you know, this is what we're filming. This is why, you know, and of course I understand they'd never seen sort of the level of equipment that we were bringing there. And, and, and they just didn't really understand um, the time we needed to pull this off and why we needed to close certain roads for safety or things like that, of course, right, as a filmmaker. And I just knew in my heart that it would be worth it. And so it was constantly like, you know, just please trust me. Like, I want this. This is so important. We need to tell the story. And um, yeah. I find one of the biggest challenges <laughs> when I go into remote areas is explaining why I need B-roll or why I need, you know, additional sound or, you know, why we have to, why we have to wait for the sun to get to a certain spot, you know? Um, uh, so uh, one question we have was, what was the reaction of women like when they saw the film or footage on set? Yeah, so one thing I learned how to say was like Conjo, which is beautiful. And I would basically just constantly have my uh, monitor and I would, every time I film someone, I would show them as like out of respect to be like, do you like this? Do you think it's beautiful? And a lot of times they were like, yeah, Conjo, Conjo is so nice. And so I'm like, okay, we're good. They like it. <laughs> and that's sort of um, something I made a habit of throughout my trip was to constantly let people see what they, what I filmed of them so that they can approve it or or whatever and the reaction was always like wow it's so beautiful so i knew i was like on a good track which is which is a really important thing too sarah and i don't think people realize as you know who aren't filmmakers that it's not just like getting someone to sign off on something or check an email or tick a box like it actually takes away from your filming time and if you're trying to have consistent light or you only have a limited amount of time or also attention or energy from the people that you're filming with because you know these are real people and and yeah. you you are you are interrupting their real lives and so um you know, you have to be respectful of that. And so to be able to take that moment and that time to show them the footage immediately afterwards um, may seem like some like, oh yeah, that seems very easy. It's actually really important I've learned too because um, contributors feel best even if they don't understand and see the whole impact which is what we're gonna get, you know, go to and talk to next. What, they, what matters to them is that they've they've seen their work and that they're they're proud of it and that they're personally happy of it. They don't have to see that it goes and reaches this many people and and affects this many lives or anything like that. But what they want to see is that like just that they're proud of it and that they see what the final result is. It doesn't just get you know absolved into this weird mystical thing that goes across borders back in a plane that they never get to travel or see. Um, and I know that um, Save the Children has done a lot of work on like a report with the impact of that as you know filmmakers and visual makers. Um, uh, if anyone's interested in kind of the, the whole understanding of that, uh, that they can go and look up and see that um, if you do, if you are someone who works in this field um, and are a story maker in this sense, you know, it's really important to follow up with your contributors um, as best you can and in any way that you can. And even if you don't get to, just trying because, you know, even the times that you do get to, it does, it does really make a difference, you know? Um, the woman actually got to see the film, which is incredible. Um, Mary Lou Hasna, who's an actress who, um, yeah, was doing some work with UNFPA, got to travel back to Afar and show them the film. And I got footage of the of the ladies watching the film, which was really beautiful. So. And it's you know, as someone who makes the content, I mean, that's why you end up making it too is for is for the people that are that are in it. Um, but let's move to the impact. I think we have. Um, Hopefully we have, uh, we're gonna have our other panelists joining us very shortly. Um, her name is, and she's coming in from Dakar in Senegal. Um, Nafisutu uh, Jocelyn Diop is the chief of the Gendered Human Rights Branch. And she's worked with the technical division since 2009 as senior advisor and the global coordinator for the UNFPA UNICEF joint program on the elimination of female genital mutilation, accelerating change the global largest program promoting the elimination of FGM within a generation. Uh, she brings more than 20 years of rewarding experience advocating for international health services, human rights, and gender equality. And alongside her expertise in leading, designing, coordinating, implementing, and managing complex programs and establishing multi-partnerships, she provides leadership and technical support globally, 
especially to African countries and the Middle East. Um, I know she's going to be joining us as soon as she's able to. And um, it's it's been a very busy week for everyone at UNFPA with the 16 days of activism. Um, and we're just lucky to be able to have Sarah and Nafi both joining us um, whenever she gets to connect. So let's, if we can, Sarah, while Nafi's coming, then I'll bring her into this question too, is what successes and impact have you seen from this series? I mean, why do we make these films? You know, we talked about the, the personal impact for the women and the fact that they got to see that, but what's been the bigger impact? Um, I think it's, it's where the conversations around this have gone because of the sort of um, different approach to the film. I, I believe, um, I think a lot of times, you know, things get kind of preached to the choir, you know, sort of where the same people are hearing the information. And I think, because we sort of challenged it or went with this fashion approach, it was able to to land in different areas. And and um, to me, one of the most beautiful things I think we were able to achieve was the conversation. Like I remember when we brought this to London, um, for example, I on purpose invited a lot of my you know fashion media like you know music type friends. And then we also had a lot of you know representatives of NGOs and humanitarian groups um, in the same room as a lot of these young, you know, um, young people. And, and the, con the mix of conversation, I think, was something beautiful and something that doesn't happen often. Um, and, and obviously, you know, obviously you have the, you know, KPIs of, you know, we, being in Nowness or, or being um, in L or all these different magazines and um, winning awards. Obviously, that's all great. But I think for me, more than anything, it's, it's having, I think when you push the envelope a bit, and even if there's a bit of controversy, I, controversy associated with something like mm -hmm. that conversation, like the fact that we're even speaking about it, you know, is 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 the the whole point, you know. And I remember um, all the women. It just starts it. It's you know, if anything, it just opens the idea, you know, that this is still yeah. a serious issue for from women all over the world. For sure, yeah. And like that's what the women were were saying to me. It's like we just need to have, we just need to talk about it. It needs to be a conversation. Um, hi, Nafi. <laughs> Hi, Nafi. Hi. Oh, um, hopefully she'll come back. Um, so it has to be a conversation. Yes. Yeah, for sure. It's a conversation, and um, and and yeah, like I think, I think that because of of the fact that it was, you know, a little bit um of a unique film for UNFPA, it was able mm -hmm. to reach so many different um sort of platforms. It's an art film, you know, it's it's not the normal film, you know, as someone that works with the organization at times as well, you know, it's it's not the the normal messaging film, you know, if anything, there are no messaging, there is no text except for at the beginning and, um, you know, and, and the subtitles. Um, and I think it's, but art is also a powerful message. It always has been, it's been, it's been part of the way we've, we've, you know, expressed ourselves and issues um, throughout all of time. And so it's wonderful that, that, there's the ability to and the vision to see and support that now. Nafi, hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. How, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you so much. I was much trying to deal with a new technology. Uh, that what I don't know the filming technology at all. So I'm discovering. Thank you. You did. You did. Thank you for persevering with us. And I and I love what you're wearing right now. And you're you're in Senegal, correct? Very cool. Oh, you, you look so summery and nice over there. I'm here in a big sweater. <laughs> <laughs> so back, back to roots. And uh, guess what? Uh, COVID, we don't really know and don't care so much here. So it's nice. Life is nice. And uh, <laughs> easy. Okay, I'm going to come to you after, Nafi. <laughs> yeah, come. You're, there is space here. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for joining us, Nafi. Um, we were just talking about impact. Um, and how, um, you know, the, the series, how this series has had success and the impact it's had um, in meeting the needs in regards to urgent issues uh, that women face around the world. Um, and I was just curious, um, what's your impression of the impact of this film and film in general when it comes to um, supporting issues for women and especially violence against women around the world? So thank you so much, and uh, you know I think it's a great initiative. And uh, you know um, UNFPA, the way I'm working and uh, with Rams and uh, who is uh, you know has partner with uh, you know Sarah and uh, all the team on this initiative, I really believe in the strengths and the you know of art 
uh, of the entertainment of um, of you know and uh, in general you know music and all the entertainment world in uh, you know changing uh, you know uh, the, some of the gender norms that we are dealing with and some of the women uh, you know issue uh, that we are dealing with so we do strongly believe in that we do strongly support your work and uh, we uh, know that power actually of image and the power of uh, the sound uh, and I think that's a one one uh, first uh, element that I can keep in mind is that you know the the, this, the, the movie, a piece of me was a beautiful way of uh, looking at a, a, a traumatic issue uh, and uh, listening to the you know testimony of survivors. And uh, I just want to start by saying by the, saying that you know survivors and, and and women or girls and also men, you know who have been subjected to violence is one of the pow most powerful tool to uh, really, um, you know, reflect and trigger change, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, listen to what exactly uh, that the situation they went through is about, but beyond the testimony, you know, trying to really, uh, you know, move people into action. And I think that, you know, having the, the, the you know, the, the, the pictures uh, beautiful, uh, uh, in addition to uh, those uh, difficult stories and, 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 and voices and, and testimony was, was is really a, a, you know a fantastic achievement. And um, for me, the impact has been actually the mixture of uh, you know the beauty, the, 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 the music, which is quite unique, so the sound, and uh, the story and the, the 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 horrible practice which is represented behind that, and uh, that has moved a lot of people. And I've seen even some um, uh, people that are not really uh, you know champions for the elimination of female genital mutilation because we are talking about that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, changing. Uh, fully and and being really silent uh, after looking at this uh, uh, you know a piece of me and that silence was actually uh, you know talking for me you know when someone is silent sometimes uh, it's it's a kind of body language and it is quite important to also uh, you know take into consideration that this is that they have been hit they have been touched in their soul, in their mind, in their thinking. And this is what really this, uh, 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 you know, that kind of movie brought. So I would like uh, to uh, really encourage about the, you know, continue on that way. Uh, and I would like to, uh, I like to talk sometimes about a movie that was, is quite old and by a Senegalese uh, filmmaker named Samben Usman. Uh, maybe in English you pronounce Sembeni, Usman, or whatever. So you can type uh, your young, but you can look on, in Google. He, he passed away now. Uh, but he's the first one who did a movie, uh, you know, on FGM. And uh, it was a full movie, right? So long, long, uh, long metrage, as we say in French. And uh, uh, that movie was so instrumental that it was able, a lot of countries were able to and pass legislation actually after this movie was you know out and and, and was uh, you know uh, screened in uh, different places in the world but particularly in african countries and that was that is the impact that we are talking about you know the way he approached it was the way uh, sarah approached also uh, you know a piece of me which was a very culturally sensitive way of approaching uh, the issue, while of course denouncing what is happening, uh, but but uh, having that um, way of using the and respecting the culture, respecting uh, the, you know the, the the people and respecting the testimony and make it in the in, you know with with all their arts you know and and, and skills you know make it beautiful, 
and and really uh, that that movie was also about that, you know. And it was so strong. Nothing violent. Nothing. Uh, we were talking about FGM, and we were talking about in a village, and there were tension and confrontation of different people and all, but all in the culturally respect way uh, that was thinking actually the person you know uh, thinking about it and I can name even countries who, where uh, things has changed after that so Molade is the name M-O-L-A-A-D-E -A -A -E, uh, of that uh, movie and I think that this is a best practice that we need to keep in mind uh, mm -hmm. how to address that and for me a piece of me was another way of doing that so you can talk about sensitive issue you can talk about you know issues that are uh, so deep uh, you know because it's touching uh, you know uh, uh, the, the, one of the main imp and important um, uh, elements of a body which is the sexual organs right uh, probably after the soul it's a uh, sexual organs is the, the next one and uh, you can you can do that and uh but you can you you can do it in a in a, uh, a beautiful and sensitive way and uh you know uh ensure and touch people and touch policy makers and touch activists and touch uh you know the heart of uh, and the mind of people who may uh, still uh you know think that this is a you know a practice that is important so uh, sensitive, yes, important to put out, yes, uh, respecting the cultural uh, aspect of it and find a way to show it, uh, you know, in a very, uh, I will repeat again, sorry, cultural sensitive way, but beautiful way. Uh, it's a way to touch, you know, heart and mind and make the change that we are looking for. Thank you. Of course, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think both of you are being so modest about the series because I believe it, it was nominated for a couple awards and might've won one of them, Sarah? Uh, yeah, we just won best uh, global campaign at the Shorty Awards and the Webby Award for 2020 for best moving image. Amazing, um, yeah. and that, that's wonderful when you can kind of see that um, all of that work and time and effort and impact then be honored in such a way. I'm just gonna put a couple links uh, in the chat for everyone to be able to follow up on the work. And we do have a question um, that I'd love to put to both of you. And it's um, from the audience. Do you think that making such a beautiful film about a shocking subject undermines the seriousness of the topic? Um, first reaction, Sarah? I would say no, um, and I've been asked this a few times, um, and the reason being is I think that we're in a culture now where everything is extremely oversaturated, number one, and I think that for me it was more important to just have people watch this, you know, and I think we see a lot of, you know, there's a lot of use of like over violence and, and traumatic and sad things, and I think I mean, I, it's very sad and unfortunate, but people tend to just glaze over that sometimes because they see it so much, you know? And I feel like for me, when I filmed this, the most important thing was to make these women look, res you know, powerful and dignified and beautiful and respected. And I wanted them, you know, to be beyond, to be seen just beyond the trauma that they experience. And, and that was really important for me to have that, um, to be able to humanize them in a way that we can look them as, you know, as if they were our own aunts, or our own mothers or, no, and, and to me, that's the way I chose to approach this. Um, however, I did I did know that there was going to be a lot of information that would surround the films. Although this was, you know, a very artful few minutes, I knew that there would be a lot of information at, at events or, you know, underneath the films that people could read about the seriousness and could sort of, um, you know, get the information they needed to, you know, fight FGM without having it to be told in the film, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And I think, you know, that's the difference between art and uh, informational or promotional or, or documentary. And it's, it is important to know kind of how you're going to frame your film and your entire, you know, how, everything around it or else, you know, you do leave your audience wondering uh, more. Nafi, yeah. um, I'd love to ask you, do you think that um, filming in such a beautiful way takes away from the seriousness of something like FGM or other harmful practices? Absolutely not. And I'm going to answer uh, to that question to say that it's not only about filming because, uh, you know, the, the showing 
in a, a you know beautiful and positive way uh you know a, a, a harmful uh practice is actually something that we have learned for almost from social science actually and from studies for almost 20 years now and uh, the program that we are implementing uh at unfpa is actually built on that in most of our programming even talking to communities even talking to uh you know uh, different stakeholders we are never uh, using shocking image of uh, the genitalia sexual gen you know the genitalia of a woman of blood of uh, there are some groups who are doing that you know and it was something that we learned as we were implementing also over the past 30 years of of uh, you know programming to eliminate this harmful practice was that the shift from uh you know brutal uh bloody uh and uh shaming uh you know uh discussion to a more positive culturally sensitive one uh highlighting and showing you know some positive uh, practice in a community is why uh, it was important and 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 even uh, you know uh, how I can say that uh, supported by research that were conducted by social science people you are getting more impact uh, than you know uh, addressing directly the issue so that's in programming in the education session in discussion with people policy makers, uh, community leaders, religious leaders and all. If you come and then you, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, some straight information on FGM, for example, which is going to harm your daughter, which is going to, automatically they won't listen. First of all, they are like shutting down, you know, because you, now you're creating a barrier between you and them. And more important is that, you know, uh, they will turn and say, okay, this is my wife, this is my daughter, this is this and that, you know, they went through FGM, they are here, they're not dead, nothing happened to them. And of course, the wife and the daughter and all are not going to say, yes, but I'm suffering, I have this and that and that in front of everybody. So the thing is that, uh, you know, if you enter into that discussion, uh, with them, uh, you know, you, 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 they will ask you to provide evidence that the practice is harmful and you will struggle to find those evidence, you know, when you're talking to a religious leader or a village leader or someone like that. It will be very difficult. WHO study on the harm of medical consequences, psychological consequences, they don't know who is WHO, they don't care. And all so this is not the way to go. The way to go is really to use a positive, uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know, entry point, and uh, you know, uh, looking at, you know, it's not that everything is bad, you know. And if I am from Africa, so I know this uh, culture more than other. Mm. And if I take that example, you know, uh, there are a lot of very good practices in Africa that actually we should share more with the world and that the world and uh, you know could, could you know adopt and you know so the discussion in looking at some of the positive elements you know encouraging people uh you know uh supporting people and then taking them into the discussion you know in, in a culturally sensitive way into uh you know recognizing themselves that this practice is after all, not so important, you know, and we have a beautiful culture, we have a beautiful tradition, we, are, we, we want to have a beautiful family, community, a country where everybody's happy, you know, and so finally, you know, what this is bringing to us, you know, so that recognition, uh, you know, need to come from within. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not external, it's in, internal process of uh, recognizing it. And that internal process of recognizing it, if you want to reach it, you really need to have the positive, beautiful vision, you know, put emphasis on what is good 
in the culture and in the tradition and not read. So it doesn't undermine. Of course, there are some uh, audiences uh, that, you know, like the sensational, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, is if I can look at now, you know, the uh, and I love them because we are working a lot, they're big partners, you know. Some of the journalists, for example, wrote mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes, you know, they, they like to use the sensational. And so, uh, and the sensational is sometimes, you know, the bad uh, and, 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 the, and the ugly uh, that they want to show. Uh, so, I can say that yes, it's shocking, and that may be needed for some people. And some audiences, uh, but uh, breaking through at scale with the majority of uh, you know uh, the the people that need to be convinced uh, is I think the, the, what Sarah you know use as uh, you know methodology and approach uh, to uh, this issue, and we are doing that in programming also. Always a positive, never we change completely. That's paradigm you know from negative to positive and then people listen people reflect we people you know are ready to change but if you use the the the, the more brutal approach then mm -hmm. people shut down absolutely yeah um you brought up so many good points nafi and i think um moving forward from from those uh you know sarah and i i think with the pandemic have been literally locked in from, you know, and, and kept away from doing a lot of the work that we normally do. And curious to hear from you, Nafi, um, what uh, other harmful practices um, you'd love to see, uh, you know, someone like Sarah um, or Sarah working on in the future um, that we could try and show in a different way? What are some things that, you know, are challenging to show visually that, um, and, but that are really needed areas that need to be focused on? I think that the breast ironing is one, uh, you know, particular issue, uh, harmful practice that we are hearing a lot. And, um, uh, you know, uh, so far uh, has not been very well covered. Mm -hmm. And it's happening a lot in, uh, in the uh, Central Africa. I mean, uh, that area. When I say Central Africa, it's not the country, but, uh, you know, that area, Cameroon, yeah. uh, and all. We are hearing this a lot. Uh, no clear study uh, yet uh, on this issue. Uh, no visual also. Uh, and it is quite interesting because actually it's, it's look from what I read, it's looked like a strategy that families and, and mother are using to protect the girl uh, from showing the external sign of uh, adolescence right mm. and those external sign is of course through the breast you know mm -hmm. which is more visible than some other and and having the breast ironing you know keep that uh, uh young i mean uh, adolescent as a child and actually that the protection comes because probably there is a lot of violence around so we are going back to the gender to the gender norms right and to the violence issue and, and 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 to the you know and to the predator pre, mm -hmm. how you say that Pred, predator predator Pred, pre, predator predator predator. Mm -hmm. predator right who are around there and actually washing if the girl is showing the, those externals you know sign so that means that she's ready for mm -hmm. uh, maturity and for rape uh, mm -hmm. child marriage. Mm -hmm. Uh, and whatever, whatever. So it's a way of protecting the girl, but it is, you know, uh, it's creating a lot of damage. So we don't know uh, so much, and it ha this has not been documented, and I, I, I think that there is a need to cover that one. And that's a very difficult issue, uh, which is one of UNFPA, uh, very important area of work, is a gen gender-based sex selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, for those who do not know, uh, there are, uh, you may have heard probably because this, that was the biggest country, China, mm -hmm. Korea, mm -hmm. India, and now it's moving to uh, the Caucasus countries, so Azerbaijan, 
uh, Pakistan and all those countries in Central Europe and all. And it can move. Mm -hmm. it, can, it can spread also to Africa. You don't know because it is spreading with the technology and the technology of ultrasound, actually, where you have ultrasound when you're pregnant. Of course, ultrasound has been created to ensure that, you know, to detect any anomaly and, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the fetus may have. Uh, and uh, but the, this is used actually to give uh, to to select uh, you know the, the boys and girls and so given the norm and the myths around boys versus girls and that boys are seen as more useful to mm -hmm. the family than girls and all this issue of inheritance and all and marriage so uh, this is how actually the fetus the girl fetus is being aborted and uh, to keep the, the, the boy fetus. So this has replaced the uh, infanticide that was happening in China, of course, under the one child policy. Uh, so it's easier, uh, the child is not born, so infanticide must be something horrible for a family, but they were still doing it because they have to choose uh, because of the policy of one child. Uh, but, uh, you know, aborting a fetus seems to be the easier one. But the problem now is that we have that imbalance into uh, the, uh, you know, uh, sex ratio, which is a natural uh, thing that, uh, you know, uh, we have 106 uh, boys born for 100 girls because the boys and the nature, yeah, this is the nature, this is God, this is whatever the creation, whatever you want to call it and whatever you are believing. I, you know, but it's a natural system that there were that kind of balance because boys are more sensitive and will, you know, and will, uh, uh, we will, uh, will die, uh, you know, in infancy and no more than girls. And so we'll have that uh, balance between the boys and girls. And uh, so now what is happening is that, of course, with this abortion, do you have that discrepancy? And which is creating a lot of tension now because we are seeing those generation and population now it's creating trafficking of girls mm -hmm. uh, to, to get married, uh, you know, so they have to go and steal, uh, you know, uh, adolescent girls or young women from other places to, do, to bring them in their country because there is no more, no more girl to marry. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of issue there. And, and, but at the root cause is really, uh, you know, patriarchy gender norms, the low value of girls. And I think that uh, this is another area where it is difficult. And we try, for example, we had a huge event at the General Assembly of the UN, that big uh, room that you are seeing sometimes on the news. And uh, we were trying to talk about those three harmful practices. So child marriage was easy and we had the testimony and uh, FGM also easy. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, some preference or gender set. So we say, okay, what we are going to do is that we are going to have a stage and, and, uh, and nothing on the stage. So means that the missing, where is the missing girl? The missing girl, how to show the missing girls uh, and the missing uh, fetus and the missing girls to be, who should have been born and that were killed. For gender and myths, uh, for gender norms and myths. So, so anyway, so that, those are ideas. So I think that it should we, we can have some uh, probably interesting way of looking at uh, the, the, that kind of harmful practice also. Absolutely. And uh, just as a number, we are talking about one one hundred and forty five million missing girls now. Thank you. Thank you, Nafi. That number is very sobering. Um, and you've given, I think, everyone on this workshop and panel and discussion, you know, things to think about, especially Sarah and I. Um, with all that information, Sarah, um, what are you looking to, to get out and do as soon as you're able to um, next? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm always looking to tell important stories. That's like literally what I do is uh, my passion is traveling and telling meaningful stories that don't often get told. Um, so yeah, like hopefully I can get out there and start planning for these again. It's it's hard not knowing sort of what world we're we're you know we're going to be working with in the next bit to be able to plan these films. But um, but yeah, I look forward to telling more stories. Um, I also look forward to doing more stories in Egypt. Hopefully, um, mm. you know where where I'm from and 
and that's something I'm trying to, you know, start making some connections and develop. But and yeah, hopefully work with uh, Nafi again at some point to to tell another uh, to tell another story um, and to yeah just do what's important. And also, I just wanted to add, like I remember you mentioned um, when we were talking that question that was asked. You had asked me about highs and lows, and I just wanted to mention that one of the biggest highs that I didn't talk about was. Um, you know, at the at the UN headquarters and at a few other places where we screen the films, I had some women come up to me after and and basically say that you know they were survivors of FGM and this and the film actually mm -hmm. allowed them to be able to be seen and, and to speak on this in a way that they never felt comfortable before. Um, I think it's because you know they they just felt like they can also be dignified and, and share that story. And so for me, that was like the biggest high from this. I think was just that we were able to allow that that space for these women. Yeah, I think having a space for women, especially a safe space to express themselves is is really important and being able to, you know, have that in, you know, translated into a film medium or any kind of art is is really really important. Um and supporting the women to do that definitely. Um there's a uh, two questions here. They're from me though, so I can't really ask you guys them. Um <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, can I share more about my experience since I've worked with UNFPA as well? Um, yeah, so I did a, a similar series, um, not quite in the same way, but it was um, a Day in the Life of a Midwife. Um, so I did a few of those for UNFPA and uh, amongst, you know, some other things, being, being on mission in Bangladesh and South Sudan. Um, and uh, I think what I, the thing I took away from almost all of those experiences um, not necessarily in, although I do speak to some people still in South Sudan um, and in Bangladesh, but um, definitely in Liberia where I went and I filmed um, and in Haiti, um, you know, I still have um, the midwife that I filmed with in Liberia on my Facebook and we talk regularly to each other. And that's, um, that, you know, and she inspired me to, to, for the title for my photo book that I came out with this year. And so um, I think the most amazing part of, of looking and trying to tell these stories is just always being inspired by the women that are on the ground and doing it and living it and, and trying to make a real change and difference because um, they, to me, they are absolutely inspirational and, and just so caring. They care so much about their work. And I love being able to translate that um, across uh, uh, film platforms and mediums for people to be able to see and appreciate. I'll never forget at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the first people that reached out to me was Yama in Liberia, of all places. You know, this is a woman who ser who who delivered babies during the entire Ebola um, outbreak in Liberia, and she was checking to make sure I was okay during you know at the beginning of COVID. Um, I owe her a response to a message, by the way, that reminds me. So, um, but I think the um, the opportunities are are endless to be able to. Uh, you know, find ways in which to take topics that most people wouldn't want to tackle and find a beautiful way, just like you did, Sarah, to to empower, to, um, you know, show by example and to give people um, something to work towards, just even visually, um, you know, and, and representation is very important. You know, if you don't see it, you don't think you can be it. And I think that's something else that's that's really, really important in some of in, in works when it comes to filming with women and and especially with topics like some of the ones that we uh, tackle. So um, Nafi, do you wanna wrap it up? You say the issue of masculinity and positive intergenerational transmission is important. We can end with you with that. Oh, just for, um, unmute yourself, Nafi, if you can. Thank you so much. If you're able I to. I think someone mute me. Yeah, someone is muting okay. me. I mean, there is someone behind. We are doing the great job, and uh, thank you so much. You know, muting, putting me back on the screen when I uh, <laughs> switch off. Anyway, uh, so I just want to. Yeah, I wanted to add that. Um, you know, uh, probably there is a lot of movies on that, but I just think that because we are moving into, uh, you know, a very uh, aggressive. Uh, gender equality agenda and uh, we all do believe uh, not only UNFPA but all the UN agency as a whole and a lot of other partner you know Gates Foundation, Ford Foundation, like blah 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 etc and a lot of government and civil society organizations think that this is enough mm -hmm. and this uh, gender equality agenda needs to be more aggressive than that it would need to be bold and uh, the pushback that we have seen for gender, uh, for women's, for women's rights issue, and we are still seeing there recently Georgia with abortion. 
uh, the U.S. themselves are not behind, uh, you know, and we have always look at, uh, you know, horrible things happening uh, on our screen. Uh, uh, and so that pushback is a real for the U.N. and very worrisome. Uh, it, now, in even member state discussion and negotiation, and you know that the U.N. is about, uh, you know, member states participation and agreeing on how to move forward the world. And in those discussions, there is a lot of pushback that are around women's rights. Uh, so I think that uh, what we are now moving into is really a very bold generation equality agenda. And uh, uh, I'm just think that the you know the, the, the your your contribution to that will be great. And one big issue for us is the positive masculinity and how to show that positive masculinity, how to show what we call reproductive labor and care. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and now with the lockdown, particularly, we have seen that, you know, women, mm -hmm. uh, you know, still working and taking, you know, uh, they, they were doing that for, 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 for years, but it has been more visible and worse now, even health health workers, you know, you know, who are health workers and saving lives, but at the same time, you know, they are mother, they are, you know, um, a, a daughter of someone who is sick from COVID or uh, take care of the kids who are not anymore in school. I mean, who were not in school and still not in school in a lot of part of the world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's shared responsibility within the house you know, between a couple, a man and a woman, you know, is, we all know the statistics, right? It's like that, yeah? Uh, and sometimes it's like a zero, 100 for the woman and zero. Uh, and the man just come home and sit and look at the TV or look at the newspaper and the woman is running around after coming from work. So we all know this. So my point, just my point is that, uh, you know, the, the positive masculinity is one of the big, issue that we would like to really to address now uh you know and the, and that has repercussion on as i said you know the reproductive care the household uh but you know everything empowerment employment but also violence you know and gender-based violence right rape treating badly uh girls women's etc uh and uh, that macho i'm the man i'm a macho uh, okay so i think that there is something there uh that could be also done so i just wanted to flag it and put it there because uh as feminists of course we are putting our strength on girls and women's empowerment and agency and decision making but at the same time we know that we have the other part of the world that we have to deal with and and if we don't want them to be perpetrator, if we want them to be positive role model for the son, uh, we we have the data that are showing that you know the boys who are beating their wife, it's because they have seen the father beat their mother, right? So that is so clear. Or they have been abused, you know, in the household, you know, and they have family, and uh, and so this is how they they were now starting to be perpetrator. Of violence also so we need to start early we need to start so that positive masculinity image you know is something that we will love to see also reflected in the entertainment world in the filming etc thank, thank you. you thank you so much gender for equality. Gender <laughs> absolutely equality. we need if we want <laughs> if we want a gender equal world we need to see one and that means in front and behind the cameras and thank you both so much for today i think yeah, everyone will so much. Everyone's going to leave this uh, discussion feeling more inspired and have, you know, hopefully more ideas. And we can continue these well long after uh, the Global Health Film Festival. So connect with us. I've put um, information in the chat box about both organizations. Um, and if you want to reach out to us and take your photo booth photo today, um, there's one for today's workshop if you can. And thank you both again to Nafi and Sarah for joining us. And um, thank yeah, you, Lauren. thank you. And uh, have a great rest of the festival day for everyone attending. Okay, take care guys.